My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask pardon for my sins and the grace to make these moments of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guiding angel, intercede for me. When we encounter Jesus in the Gospel, we usually expect to find someone who is full of compassion, someone talking about forgiveness and mercy and reconciliation. But just every now and then, Jesus talks about something slightly different, and today's Gospel passage is one of those times. It's where he starts to explain the coming destruction of Jerusalem, and all the language changes. He's not talking about forgiveness and mercy as much as days of vengeance and distress upon the earth and wrath upon people. Well, that doesn't sound particularly appealing, that's for sure. And really, if we're sincere, all this talk of woe and destruction, calamity and travail is kind of hard for us to reconcile with our own experience of the faith, because what we have more than anything else is, is the joy of having Christ. But then it keeps getting more interesting, because at the end, Jesus gives us a new image of himself. He says, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Well, this isn't the meek and humble Jesus that we're accustomed to either. Suddenly he's giving us a vision of himself with all his power, and as if it were kind of flying into battle, so to speak. These are the images that we can read about in the book of Revelation, the Dies Irae, the day of the wrath when God comes to unleash his vengeance upon the wicked. And it seems almost strange to us because the Jesus Christ we habitually see is one hanging from the cross, one who gives himself in sacrifice. The Jesus Christ we traditionally see in the gospel is the one who wants to be alongside the sick and the one who wants to reconcile sinners. Hardly the one who wants to come with power and might. Hardly the kind of thing that speaks of destruction of enemies. And, of course, it's the same Jesus Christ that we see in the agony in the garden. It's the same Jesus Christ that there, while he was suffering, said he could call upon legions of angels to save him if he wanted to. And that's the key, that Jesus chose not to. We realize that that meek and humble Jesus that walked the face of the earth seeking the poor, the sick, the lame, the blind, helping people to repent. Well, that Jesus Christ is so meek and humble and gentle, not because he didn't have any other option, but because that's the option he freely chose. You, Jesus, in fact, had all the power in the world. You had more. You had all the power in the universe. You had all power. And you chose not to use it. Really interestingly is that you chose not to use it in order to draw people to yourself instead. There are a few things in Jesus' message which are really, truly radical, like the way he talks about forgiveness, and this is another one, where we see Jesus coming in glory and power as he explains in today's Gospel. We realize that that's something exclusively for the end time, a kind of necessary event in order to assure that justice is fully done. But in the here and now, the where you and I live, that's not what's necessary. Why? Because Jesus, in a certain sense, is calling us to let others win. To let others win in things which, in the end, aren't the most important, so that we can win their hearts, so that we can win their souls. What Jesus needs is not power. He needs conversion, the conversion of the people around him. And that's exactly the same thing that we, his disciples, look for too. The conversion of the people around us, and in our case, our own conversion too. Well, Jesus, it's true. You call us to be the peacemakers of this world. And one thing's for sure that we couldn't have asked for a better example than the one that you've given us, because your whole life here on earth, you spent seeking reconciliation with others. And we look at you and we look at the way that peace is always a product of your presence. And 
the way that the contrary, the way that discord is always a product of the devil's presence. We know that we want to follow in your footsteps. We know that we want to learn to be peacemakers. And if it were just a matter of stopping world wars or preventing nuclear holocaust, we would probably all be pretty effective peacemakers. But Lord, I suppose we all know that that's not the kind of peacemaking you're asking of us. You're asking us to be peacemakers and things which are much, much smaller, and then in a certain strange sense, much more difficult. Much more difficult, not because they're physically harder, but because it's easy to justify ourselves in really small things. This is the kind of thing that we find with family and friends all the time. Someone wants the window open, the other person wants it closed. Someone wants the heater turned up, another person wants it turned down. Someone wants the music on, another person wants it off. Or in other things that perhaps that thing someone said to me which I didn't like, or that moment someone treated me in a way that I thought was unfair. And then if we're not careful, that all leads to this kind of vicious spiral where we sit there and contemplate to ourselves why the window needs to be open or what I should say to that person. Why, if I had the chance, I would tell him and that kind of thing, the, well, if I had a chance, or if I could, is a big alarm bell for us. It's an alarm bell that says, watch out, hang on, you're supposed to be the peacemaker. Now, I don't know if you've ever read the books by Dr. Zeus. I used to read them a lot when I was little. My parents were big fans of Dr. Zeus. And he has one book called The Butter Battle Book. And it's all about two rival factions one of whom butters their toast butter side up and the other butters their toast butter side down. Well, these two factions develop such an antagonism about the matter that they start to build weapons in order to conquer the other faction. And each time one team builds a weapon, the other builds something bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until in the end they build weapons that are so big and so powerful they can obliterate everyone and everything. Now, as it happens, Dr. Zeus was writing a story that was an analogy of the Cold War, and a pretty good one. I'm told that at the height of the Cold War, the United States had enough weapons to kill everyone in the Soviet Union 400 times, referred to as 400 times overkill. And I presume in the Soviet Union, they had about the same amount of nuclear weapons directed towards everyone in the United States. At the really minor personal level, the same thing happens to us, that we can escalate things unnecessarily, and we especially do it inside our head. That's not good for us, and it's not good for the people we deal with either. We're called to be peacemakers. Even if we have the power to do something, we don't necessarily use that power. Why? Because we're not looking to win. We want to choose, to choose what is best for souls, not what satisfies you and I. And being able to do that... That's true freedom. We know that we're truly free when we have the capacity to leave our emotions aside and to look for what's truly best for the people around us, which in general is what's truly best for us too. It's there that we live out our vocation to be peacemakers in this world. Because the great weapon of the Christian is not the atom bomb, but the capacity to defuse it. Defusing it not just by defusing the bomb itself, but by defusing, in a certain sense, the person who wants to detonate it. That way, we don't just solve the problem of the bomb, we save the soul behind it as well. But that's tough. It's particularly tough because it means not arming ourselves with the bomb as well. It means that even if sometimes we would love to have, and even we would love to use that 400 times overkill, just to get our back on someone who offended us, we choose not to. But to overcome our emotions like that can be really, really difficult. It can cost a lot. But souls are worth a high price. Jesus paid for souls with his own life. So, as Christians, we have taken master classes in how to become peacemakers in this world. But as humans, it's always going to be difficult for us. That's why, as always, Jesus, we turn our hearts to you and ask you for the help to put those things into practice. You who are the peacemaker.
we ask you, Lord, to teach us how to diffuse, to defuse our own emotions, to think clearly, to think supernaturally, and to defuse those around us, to learn to be sowers of peace, to learn to be masters of humanity who understand other people, who can get inside the heart of someone and bring them peace, to end arguments, not to escalate them. And now, as we end our time of prayer, of course, we go to the Blessed Virgin Mary and we ask her, Queen of Peace, to help us bring that peace to souls around us, to bring that peace to souls around us by having it first ourselves, and then learning how to understand other people, work with them, in order to sow peace throughout the world, wherever we walk. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this time of prayer. I ask your assistance in putting them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.